Hey, Construction Legends. So this is episode two of an interview I had with Martin Prince of the Building Talks podcast. And in it, we talk about how the latest developments in technology are going to impact construction, why AI is going to specifically impact the white collar side of construction and how you can use the tricks that we talk about in the episode to increase productivity by using AI in your construction business. So enjoy and I'll chat to you soon. So, to, so tell us a bit, so you formed um, Quantum Contract Solutions before COVID, wasn't it? So 2019, we'd obviously mm-hmm. touched upon uh, the reasons, I guess, that triggered you into setting that up. So tell us a bit about the business and, and what it does. And you mentioned there that you, or earlier that you operate in the States as well, uh, in the United States as well as here. So yeah, tell us about the, the business that you've set up and and what you provide and, and where you can add a bit of value to, to different subcontractors or head contractors or within the construction space. Yeah, so, we, I mean, we've talked about the problems that they face. And so, the I guess the key linchpin here is, if you want to solve these problems yourself, you're gonna have to hire contracts people, contracts administrators, contracts managers, maybe a lawyer, whatever it happens to be into your business. Now. Even with that considering, depending on the size of your company, that might be worthwhile. Now, every large construction company, right, will, you know, if you just start rattling off costs here, you probably know better than I do. For almost every project, well, the in-house, they'll have, they might have an in-house lawyer or two or a team of in-house lawyers, right? So I don't know what we're talking about. We're co- talking about a couple of hundred grand, if not more, right, per annum in salary. Then yeah. you've got your contracts administrator, quantity surveyor, or contracts manager, manager, which is another 200 odd, right? Now, the let's just step back for a second and think to ourselves, the biggest and best construction companies are willing to spend money of that, ca- uh, of that amount on those people on projects for a reason. Okay, and essentially, you know, that's that's your game, Martin, right? Mm. And so, and uh, and by all accounts, you, you, uh, you're very good at it. But they're willing to spend do that for a reason, and the reason they're willing to do that is because there is a return on investment on that by having those people. So by you not having that those people in your business, you're losing money. Why is yeah. that? You're because you're signing a crappy contract. Your cash flow is probably terrible because you're not getting your change orders variated the EOTs across the line. You're probably not getting paid what you should get paid, and you and you could be finding yourselves in disputes. Right? That's yeah. kind of the stuff that can happen. Now, where we fit in is kind of that level of company is probably smaller than the guys that you deal with, that they cannot afford to hire those people in house, and so. They use our service to be able to perform those functions. So we will do their contract reviews for them. We'll negotiate their, their contracts to make sure that they are they sign a lowest contract. We'll do all of their paperwork in the post-award phase to make sure that they're getting their EOTs, change orders, variations approved. We'll give them advice. They can just bang on a call with someone on our team if they're if they're getting in a dispute, if they have any contractual issues, and we can have a chat and we can we can strategize about how it's how to play it out. You get yourself into a dispute, it's a race to see who loses the least amount of money. That's yep. that's the bottom line. So you can get all of our services using our, our using our company. We're fully online. Um, and, it, and you know, sometimes people think, oh, well, if they're online, they're, they're not going to be able to see what's happening. With most companies that have these people back in their head office anyway. So you got to jump on Zoom to chat to them anyway. So it does make a difference. We can jump on with you. We're like available all, all of the time. We basically work 24-7 across seven days a week. So it makes achieving that contractual success much easier. And so yeah. construction is about is about really two things. It is constructing things, supplying things, building things, but also about getting paid for it. And we are mm-hmm. the getting paid for it side of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, you said any firm, okay, and it might sound a little bit like we, we make sure you get paid. So uh... Come and come and see us, and we'll go and visit them. So, do you? How does that work then? So, you you you're the front of uh, you sort of face your clients' clients on their behalf, or you kind of guide them, support them, and coach them to present themselves as the the focal point in the business for these contractual matters, getting paid, EOTs, whatever it might be. Yeah, it's it's the second. So, we want our clients to we want 
you know, the their clients to look at our clients and say, yeah, these guys are super professional. They know what they're talking about. They're switched on. And so we, uh, you know, it, there's certain times where we're asked to join meetings on if it's a really tricky negotiation and there's like, they're just, oh, we just, we just got this guy. He's going to come in and help us with this negotiation. We do that from time to time, but yeah. more often than not, it's giving them all of the information they need to have the meeting themselves um, and the strategy that they need to get a good outcome. Yeah. And so, so you, the business is based in Perth, but what countries are you operational in as a business? We're in um, Australia, New Zealand, US. Yeah, and are you, are you seeing, I mean, I often get advised by different employers that everything's different from one state to the next in Australia or one country to the next, but with your uh, position and being able to see sort of New Zealand, Australia, US, are, there, are, are, they, are the same issues in every country and across most contracts and most markets? Or are certain, uh, is there unique issues in each country or in each geographical region or anything like that? It, it, it's nuanced. So in Australia, each state has a different different set of laws. Mm-hmm. In the US, each, each state has different laws, 50 different laws, essentially. New <laughs> yeah. Zealand as well. And so, but you got to think about it is the, the contract itself, right, is is secondary to the law, right? So the law is above the contract and the contract falls as part of that. What what we're talking about is in the confines of that contract. So it's within the contract. Outside of the contract, you're gonna need you're gonna need lawyers. If you're out if something is outside of the contract, you're in trouble. You're in big trouble, right? So let's our job is to make sure that that doesn't happen. You don't get to that big trouble. So we're in the confines of a contract. And so that is commercial principles. That is understanding what the contract says. Now, there are some nuances, like in some states in the US, paid when paid is legal, right? And in Australia, paid when paid is illegal. So, you know, what, what I mean by that is you in in some st- in some states in the US, you can they can say to you, hey, we haven't been paid and therefore we can't pay you. Yeah, okay. okay, which is brutal, right? Mm-hmm. So there's a few little instances like that, but the contract will still say that, and so it's everything is within the confines of the contract, and it's set it based on commercial principles. So there's different terminology; things are called different things. Like so, in the US, there's a re- retain a retention uh, retainer. In here, it's ret- retention, right? In in Australia, so mm-hmm. but expertise wise it doesn't it doesn't really matter provided you have the expertise to understand what is in the contracts themselves yeah yeah and then i guess within your business then so you'll, you'll have what contract specialists in the u.s in new zealand in australia or people from yes. the u.s in australia yes um interesting and how, how are they with new zealand and then u.s laws and interstate laws do you have to be because i'm guessing you probably have to yeah, it must be quite difficult. Before you can answer any question technically, you have to think, right, well, what law are we referring to and in what country? Is that is that quite tricky to get your, your well, head across the all? Well, no, no. Again, it's not. It's, we're talking about the con- the contract itself. Okay. We're not trying to we're not trying to talk about the laws based on 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 those contracts. It's like what is in the contract itself, yeah. and how does that impact the, your risk profile, and how does that intra- in, uh, impact your cost? Right. It's not necessarily the legalities of 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 what's happening at the legal level. Right. right All okay, we're yeah. concerned about is reducing your risk and reducing your cost. It's not about the, the legal side of things. It's we got to be clear on that. It's mm-hmm. it's it's cash flow. It's risk. It's cost. That's yeah. what we're concerned about. OK. At the end of the day, that that's yeah. it. And so. Again, within each state, there are things that matter, and we have experts that, that, that deal with it, but it really, we're talking about what is in your contract. What are you signing in the contract? And what's it yeah. asking you to do? And that's where you support the, the clients that you have. And if we focus exclusively into Australia, there's already, there's been some pretty big, I mean, in the last, say, well, I can't remember, I saw an article the other week maybe two or three weeks ago, I forget in which newspaper, but it was referring to the, the number of businesses going into administration uh, nationally, but also specifically in construction. And construction, I forget what the figures are, but it's significantly higher volume of construction organizations going into administration than, than traditional businesses. So how do you see 2023 playing out for this ongoing risk? Do you think we're gonna have a lot more um, 
well, we probably will, but what, what, how are you seeing the market and what do you expect to happen as regards administrations and companies going into stress and what have you? Is it yep. going to be a tricky year, going to be a tricky few years or how do you measure it or review it? So my, my general thesis on these things is you can only control what you can control in your own business. And so you need to control your own your own set of risk, what you can control. The market's going to do what the market's going to do. You don't know what the market's going to do, right? We don't know. Ultimately, you can you can have a guess, and it, it, you know, I think Warren Buffett's always talking about if you're trying to time the market, you know, you're you're just you're at nothing, right? So, um, so we can try and time it. We can think it's going to go down, we, but we don't know. So I I I will state that that is my my general belief. Just control what you can control. But in general, if we're looking forward to to it, we can see that construction companies are going out of business. Now, what what why is that happening? It ultimately it's because the the inflation is is increasing the cost of materials. And I don't know where the people are, but there's no people. You can't get people to do stuff, and, which is also <laughs> increasing the cost of the people that you're. They've disappeared, right? I don't know where they're hiding. I, I genuinely, yeah. they've disappeared everywhere in the world, right? No one can get anybody. So they must in be somewhere chilling well. out, right? Relaxing yeah. Yeah. in every industry, right? So there's some, somewhere in the world where there has to be a, an, an excess of people. I don't know where they are. <laughs> yeah. So you can't get people. So the cost of the people that you can get are is much higher. Okay, and I think everyone's experience is it. Or you've got to get worse people for more money as well, mm. which is, is, is a thing that's happening too. And so they're kind of things that are happening in the industry itself. The cost of finance and the cost of debt is going up dramatically, obviously. So costs in general are all increasing. Now, if you sign the, uh, oh, the other part of it is during COVID, as part of stimulus, the government stimulated the, the construction industry, which in itself is is it's better than handing out money to go spend money like like they did a few years ago just go spend money because you end up spending on electronics electronics typically come from china money goes to china eventually at the end of the day right whereas if you spend money in construction at least you end up with an asset at the end of the day so if you're stimulating you're ending up with projects you're ending up with schools you're ending up with ho hospitals so it's a better way to stimulate the economy in my opinion even houses even i i, I you know I think we'll all agree that, that what happened in Australia during COVID, basically the grants, they got you can get 70 grand worth of grants, but then everything costs 70 grand more, basically, yeah. right? Yeah. We can see that that happens. Obviously, that sort of stuff happens, but it's still a better solution than other other things, in my opinion. And so all of these projects kicked off. There's loads and loads of projects kicked off. And so what we're seeing now is people can't deliver on the projects. So they won a project based on a particular price that might have been lump sum. And then now that lump sum is no, it's no longer profitable. They can't get the materials. They couldn't get the people. The cost of debt is increasing and then bang, that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. And so while that is kind of playing itself out, I think that will continue to play it, it out over the next, over the next year. But I'm pretty generally in the construction industry, I'm positive, I'm a pretty positive. So there might be a contraction, a, a reduction in, in, in the amount of projects that are happening. But I think the government always does lean on construction to stimulate things. And so resting on that, I think that's, as construction, it, it's good. But if you are a smart business and you've looked after your own basket of goods and you're, you're keeping your risk down, I think genuinely, if while other people might be going out of business, if you're one of those companies, you're going to clean up and fortunes are made um, in, in downturns. And if you're a good construction company, that's a good operator, um, you will do very, very well. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think I said in my business during uh, the COVID lockdowns and whilst it was nerve wracking at the time, it was a good opportunity. And, and I think that's true of a lot of businesses that either start off when markets are tough or make it through tough markets. They become leaner, more efficient, better at what they do. They've saved costs they've improved opportunities on margin so um it's just a matter of trying to as you say get your, your own house in order sort of thing um one of the other things i'm interested in and, and some of our listeners may or may not know but you're obviously um, and you touched upon it at the start you enjoy business as well so you you enjoy and you obviously you read a lot of um business related sort of books um one of the things you you also do is you run your own podcast as well like myself which is how we sort of came across one another, uh, we, we sort of operate in our jobs on in a similar sort of space. 
Um, and you talked about marketing and things like that. What for you is so important in the modern world um, with marketing? And you've touched upon AI again. How, how do you sort of revolve that into your sphere of knowledge or understanding? And, and, and how do you you're talking to our listeners that own businesses, be they head contractors, subcontractors, whatever they might be? How do you intertwine your understanding of marketing and podcasts and, and, and all these other items that are sort of slightly unique to businesses in construction? How do you uh, weave that into your, your, your sort of your daily work and your, your interaction with clients? Well, the, the, the landscape of business is, is different now. Okay, so I, I tell you, like I'm, when I started off the business in Perth, I used to spend my days going, St. George's Terrace is, is like the main strip. Yeah, of all yeah. the CBD and all I would do right I was in a state of constant caffeination right where I would walk <laughs> up and down trying to meet people for coffees yeah this is like amateur amateur hour and so what I learned through help and and lots of lots and lots of money spent on mentors and masterminds and uh, business help is that media is leverage and so it used to be social media where I, you would follow me and you'd see my stuff, uh, but that's not the case anymore. It's more interest-based now. And so basically, if you look at podcasts, if you look at all the different media channels like LinkedIn or, or whatever, that is essentially how TV and radio used to be. It, it, that's, that's it. And so if you can leverage media for your business, it's something that is you can reach more people. If you can have a business that is, you can serve more people, it obviously, you can help more people. And so it's about using leverage. Like, so, you know, there's there's a guy, uh, there's there's a really book, a really good book called The Alamac of, of Naval. So Naval, Navi, Ravikant, Navikant, I can't remember exactly, is really good Sil Silicon Valley entrepreneur, he invested in Uber and all of these guys. And he talks about um, leverage. And there's different kinds of leverage. There's leverage in people. So you employ people, then you can have more leverage in your business, obviously, because you can do more stuff and you can help more people. Another type of leverage is finance. You can, if you can get other people's money, you can obviously do things quicker because you can hire more people and you can have, get more sales in your business quicker by using other people's money. And there's software. AI, and then by doing, by writing software, by using AI, you can deliver things quicker. And again, you can help more people. And the other one is media, and which is podcasts, um, YouTube videos, YouTube shorts. And so while so many people look at people like Mr. Beast, right, who's the biggest YouTuber out there, you know, and they look at views and stuff and, and they get really disheartened. And, and believe me, I've been disheartened so many times by the amount of people, the views or the limited number of views. But it, it's all relative in that, you know, my audience is construction subcontractors. And so if only 200 people watch a video or 50 people watch a video, that's 50 CEOs and general managers watching a video uh, that, that, we've put, that we've put together. And so originally that was disheartening as oh, I don't have the views of like these Logan Paul guys or whatever. But all of a sudden you, you start getting sales from these things and people trust you and like you. And because of you putting that out to the market, you are using leverage to your advantage. And over time, leverage compounds, your audience compounds, the amount of people that are watching yourself compounds, the amount of people that you can help compounds. And so while the, the biggest thing about these social media things is people go, oh, they do something for a month. They do something for six months even, and they get no results. Mm -hmm. And they go, oh, that's good. I'm, I'm not going to try it anymore. You've got to do it. you got to do it for years. And when you do it for years, only then does it start to compound and, and matter and work and just needs to be built in. This is business now. And even for construction companies, I would suggest that construction companies having podcasts or cornerstone content is like it's almost mandatory now if you want to continue to grow or if you want to grow bigger if you're happy with where you are that's fine but if you want to grow as a company it's something you should be doing and for our listeners out there that may or may not be aware of what cornerstone content is if you're a subcontractor that does uh i don't know rio or or a carpentry firm or a, or a glazing organization or whatever they might be what type what, what is cornerstone content and I, as i'm sat here talking my chair i've got some issue i'm gonna it keeps dropping so before long you're gonna be looking at the top of my head as, and the tip of my knees um 
so yeah, what, what kind of cornerstone content would you, for, for listeners in subcontracting space, could they think about adding to their, their marketing? Okay, so I, I give you my best, I think this is a great idea. So I, I'll give you the, the concept. So the concept originally, I, I saw this back in Ireland, there was a company called Bruce Shaw. They're actually called Line Sites. They've grown, right? They've grown from Ireland. They're all over the world. They're in, they're in Australia now as well. They're in the US, they're in Singapore, huge company. They were called Bruce Shaw when I was working for them years and years and years ago. And what they used to do back then was they would produce a handbook that was cost per whatever, cost per linear meter of X, cost per linear meter of how to build a house, to big, dig a hole, whatever it was. They just produced this document uh, twice a year, once a quarter, I don't know, I don't know the exact time frame. And they would give it to all of their clients um, and people could use that to estimate costs. And it was pretty, it was the most accurate thing that was out there because it was the most up-to-date costs based on on whatever. And they still do this to, to this day. And that was their cornerstone content. And they, they might even sell it for a small amount of money or they give it away for free. But so now these guys, they, they did cost management. And so if you're looking for someone for an estimate, who better to go to than the guy that the guys that produces this document? And they're all of a sudden yeah. looked at as you are the best guys in the industry because you produce this cornerstone piece of content. Um, so that is one of the ways to do it. A very smart way, I think, to do it from if you're a scaffolder or if you're, what was your example, Martin, that you asked me about? Oh, carpentry firm or a, a concrete uh, right, contractor. A, a carpentry firm, right? So if you, if you were able to produce a course or a certification or a training that trained up, like to train a supervisor how to supervise carpentry work for whatever, right? And so you ran this course that was for supervisors on how to whatever it is, like, you know, a certification. Okay. And so you did that. And this particular business that you are running on the side of your business, kind of like a front end product, you don't, doesn't necessarily have to make huge amount of money. If it breaks even, that's, that it can just work away and break even. And, and that can be okay. So a couple of things that are going to happen from doing that. One is they're the guys that do the certification for carpentry, right? So first of all, they, they are, you know, they obviously are going to be great at what they do because they're the guys that do the certification. Okay. So that's mm -hmm. the first thing. Second thing is, people that are coming into the certification, you're gonna get leads from those guys to become a client to do the jobs that you that you need to do. Okay, yeah. so if, if, if a CEO of a company says, oh, I want my supervisors to do that thing. Oh yeah, okay, right. So they've done the supervising and you've built in a system to go, okay, you reach out to that CEO, hey, XYZ has now been trained. Uh, can, you know, can we, could we potentially get on your books to be you know, a preferred supplier, blah, blah, blah. You, you create an, uh, an agreement with them. Now you've gotten this stream of income that is not tendering. Or maybe it is tendering, but you're getting invited, you're invited directly by the client. And so those it gives you opportunities to do those things. You can offer things. You could, you could now say, you could, so for example, you got me onto this podcast, right? Or, mm -hmm. or I, we, we, we're on this podcast together. There's benefit to both of us for being on this podcast, right? You get a podcast and then I, I obviously, obviously can get out there as well. When you've got yeah. a training course like that, you can go to a client and go, hey, hey, you can use it as leverage. Hey, we can do this, but we can also train your guys up and certify them to be better at supervisors. Oh, value. Right? Yeah. Or you can, and you could sell it for a 20% discount or wh whatever it is. So you've, you've gone to them to give them value, right? You've not reaching out to them for work. You're reaching out to them to, hey, I can give you value. I can get all you guys trained up. Uh, happy to give you guys a bit of a discount if we can become a bit of a, uh, you know, we can create a relationship. Okay, bang, you trained them all up. Now you've got this relationship with a new client. Okay? Yeah. That's what Cornerstone content does. That's what it gives you. And then that little thing, if you can get that business to pay for itself, you're essentially getting relationships and leads for free. Yeah, yeah. Definitely not something that many builders or construction organizations are aware of, but I think they're, they're kind of learning it. And you mentioned AI as well, which is, in my industry, that's something that's there's a bit of chit chat around AI and, and, and different things within the recruitment sector. But within construction, what what kind of AI, be it platforms or ideas, have you got that can support uh, construction companies? So I think right now where we are is, I don't know how AI can help your company. I don't know how AI can help a scaffolding company. That's essentially, that's for you to figure out, right? Just candidly. But the thing about it is, 
if you were a truck driver on a mining site, you know, a, a couple of years ago, well, whatever amount of time, and you heard about self-driving trucks coming in, right? That's that's where we are now. Mm. Now you, as a company, can make a decision to do nothing and be made redundant, or you can make a decision to be upskilled, and then you can be the guy that is driving five trucks from joysticks, right, yeah. wherever it is. Yeah, and so that's it. So. What we're doing in our team is we're constantly challenging people. How can we use AI to increase our output? Because, you know, if we're the company that can do all this contractual stuff using AI, well, that's great. We're still going to be in business, right? But if not, well, then we're probably going to go out of business. And so we need to be, and you need to be, probably, it's up to you, of course. Uh, and the subcontractors need to be an AI enabled company. How can we use AI to get better at what we do? Because even let's just say you can do all this contract stuff, AI can do all of this contract stuff, or you could use a platform. You're still like you still couldn't be bothered to do it if you're if you're if you're a scaffolding company, and there's a, an AI platform that you could potentially use to do your contracts. You still wouldn't know the prompts. You still wouldn't know how to do it properly. You still don't even know the right questions to ask it to, or like you don't understand. You don't have the knowledge, right? And so you'd still outsource to a company to do that for you because they know how to do all that stuff quicker for you. Yeah. Does that make sense? And so that's yeah. kind of where we're going and that's what you want to be. And so I guess the only way to get there is just to continually upskill your own company to use AI. So, I mean, using ChatGBT is, uh, is, is a simple way to, to start. Let's start playing with ChatGBT. How can you use ChatGBT to... Uh, GPT how can, to do things quicker in your business. How can you get the, the people in your business to start using chat GPT to do stuff quicker? Yeah, yeah. And have you, have you, I mean, I only came across, I heard about chat GPT, chat GPT multiple times. And I didn't really know what it was. I thought it was like, um, I thought it was like Google basically. And then I was speaking to actually the people that do my website and they were talking about how other people had mentioned to them um, and I had a had a bit of a go at, uh, at using it for some information. But what I found was it was great at sort of typing it all up and putting it together. And I assume the grammar was quite good because my grammar is shocking. And I assume a computer's grammar is better than mm -hmm. mine because I think my six-year-old is probably better than mine. But um, I then had to go through it and alter it anyway. So um, so whilst in that instance, it's obviously good and it's somewhere, it's something that as a business owner, you, you, you need to have somebody check it anyway, as you say, or you need to have somebody make sure that the if it's contracts, because I, I read somewhere that HR managers can write employment contracts, um, but you've still, even if it could, you've still got to check it and make sure it's valid and it's relevant yep. and, it, and it does what you need to do. But but it will come a point like digital cameras eventually replaced, um, I don't even know what it's called, the, the, what do we call it, film that we had to put in cameras. It might have taken a while, but eventually it replaced it completely, so I'm sure uh, yeah, there are there are certainly things that people can do within their businesses to use, um, well, any form of uh, form of AI, and for that matter as well. And you must have seen this as well. Um, I've had previous guests on the show that have spoken about the advancements of construction technology, mm -hmm. um, be that pay apps or or different financial software or things like that. Is that something that you encourage uh, subcontractors to sort of buy into and become a part of and? Uh, and get better at yeah you, you have to you have to you have to you, you've got you've got to be if you can be quicker and faster than the other company you're it's going to be a benefit to you yeah yeah um all right well thank you for your time Keen. so uh, before we finish up do you want to uh, give the listeners an idea of how they can reach out to you or the business or if they've got any questions or queries how they get in touch or how they um hopefully try and um take some uh, some of your guidance and opportunities to, to learn from you or get in touch with you? How, how would they do that? Yeah, sure. So just to, if you're looking to learn how to negotiate your construction contract, there's a playlist on YouTube. You go to Construction Secrets is our channel. There's a playlist there. It, that'll walk you through everything. So that's a good way. That's a good place to learn. Uh, Construction Secrets, the podcast itself is, is just search it and you'll, you'll find it um, wherever you listen to it. And that is essentially 
all of the war stories, all of the contractual little things that if you listen to that over time, you will become essentially contractually savvy. You'll understand all of these things. So that's you learning how to do it yourself. If you want us to do all of the legwork for you, just go to quantumcontractsolutions.com and you can get us that way. Yeah. Uh, and that's anywhere in Australia, as well, most of our listeners in Australia. So be it Victoria, be it New South Wales, Queensland, wherever it might be. You operate wherever, nationally Australia, seven days New a week. Zealand. Yep, Australia, New Zealand, um, and US. US, good man. All right, well, um, thanks for your time, Keen. I appreciate that. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day, mate. Hopefully uh, our listeners take plenty of information from that. Thank you, Martin. Hey, Construction Legends, I hope you enjoyed that. If you want more of the same, please click here to have another cool video. And we've also got a full contract negotiation training course. It's six weeks, everything you need to do to negotiate your own contract. It's a playlist, click on it, go through all the training, and it'll make you way, way better and, and allow you to sign way less riskier contracts and set yourselves up for success. Okay, so choose one of them and go, for, go forth and conquer.